So this is a bit of a dry topic, but I hope it's helpful for some of you. Really quickly, I'm going to go over the kinds of changes I like to make in the init files when starting up a fresh installation of Door Fortress. Now, this isn't meant to be a tutorial exactly, as I'm not going to go into detail on these files, but you might still learn a thing or two from it, and certainly in a lot less time than it would take to fully understand them. I'm only going to cover the changes I prefer to make and why. All of these changes are subjective, but some I think will significantly improve your quality of life if you plan to spend any length of time with this game, and I hope you do because it's a great game. If your plan here is to just copy what I do, I've included links to my versions of these text files in the description, so presuming the version of Door Fortress you're playing is relatively similar, you can grab them if you like. Now enough with the disclaimers, I'm just going to get into it. The inits basically replace what would usually be an options interface in a normal video game. Honestly, I find a text document easier to navigate and modify than a bunch of pages of slider bars, so I don't mind at all. You can find these files inside the folder you have the game extracted to. Within the data file, there's an init file, which has all three of the text files I'll be changing in this video. Let's start with the D init files. Admittedly, I'm not sure what the D stands for, and I haven't been able to find out. Maybe dwarf. But this one has more to do with the in-game options than the other init files. I always go for seasonal autosave so that a potential crash isn't quite as detrimental when it happens. You might be interested in an initial save. I prefer to not do this as I like to scout on my embarks before committing to them. I prefer that embark tunnels are always shown because if possible I like to embark on them for flavor reasons. Many of my favorite fortresses have involved embarking on a tunnel. Logging map rejects isn't something I turn on initially, but if I'm experimenting with world gen and running into problems, I'll switch it on to find out why I'm getting so many map rejections. I changed the embark rectangle to 3x3, as a majority of the time that's the size of my embark. I'd love to do 4x4 or even 256 tile embarks, but unless the game gets multi-threading support or sees other significant optimization improvements, such large embarks would be a pipe dream until there are drastic improvements in consumer CPU technology. A lot of the changes I make to the inits are based around performance. I turn off Pet Burial as the default so I don't have to change this manually every time I slap down a coffin to keep some dwarf from stuffing his stupid dead goat in the sacred tomb. I'm gonna scroll past all of the tile preferences because they're things that I never really change. I prefer to set labor skills to no to remove the extra step of undesignating unwanted labors on dwarven migrants. I personally find that I remove more labors than I add to incoming citizens. I'll knock down the population cap a bit, as it's something I prefer to increase incrementally. Usually when I'm at the stage that I want more soldiers, I'll increase it. As for children, well, I definitely want to knock this number down. I'd love to let pregnancies run free, but due to performance issues, I only have so much room for my population, and I'd prefer to be able to use that population before approaching FPS death. Keep in mind this number doesn't stop child migrants, so you could still end up with 50 or 80 of them even with this number at zero. For FPS reasons, I'm going to decrease the visitor cap. This is something that I could always increase later if I feel that things are running smoothly and I want more visitors. Some people prefer uniform engravings instead of more literal depictions, so toggle this if you hate seeing little triangles and dwarves carved into your walls and floors. Keep in mind that you can dictate specifically what's engraved, though. I prefer varied ground tiles as I think it looks better, and for the same reason I don't like seeing digits all over water and magma sources. Last here, I'm going to make it so nicknames I give dwarves replace their entire names. This is because if I name a dwarf Slappy, I prefer that his name appears as Slappy and not Slappy Melville Kokeb. That's pretty much everything I do with a D in it, so I'm going to save it and move on to the regular in it. Now, the music Toady has composed is absolutely beautiful, and if you haven't heard it, you should listen to it. I've heard it many hundreds of times, however, and prefer more varied soundtracks. I do stick to classical guitar while playing Dwarf Fortress, and if you want recommendations, I'll regularly include composer and performer information in my video descriptions. I also turn off the fun intro video due to having seen it many, many times. For font, I prefer to go with Curses Square 16x16.png. This is included with the game and makes it so that game tiles are square instead of the rectangular default. I've gotten a lot of flack for using vanilla fonts, and there are many custom fonts and graphics packs available, so check them out and find one that works for you. I love how this one looks, however, and I am set in my ways. The graphics options are only relevant if you're using a pack, and I personally don't use those, but I think they tend to come in preloaded versions. 
I do like to pay attention to my FPS, so I will turn this on. Now, the FPS cap is a little bit misleading. What this actually refers to is a cap on how many turns the game will process in a second. If you set this to zero so that there's effectively no cap, you might notice that while your fortress is small, the dwarves move at lightning speeds. I actually prefer things this way as it simply speeds things up at the beginning and things slow down eventually anyway regardless of whether or not I want that to happen. If you're relatively new to the game, I recommend leaving it at 100 and setting the graphical refresh rate to 25 to help with performance as it doesn't really make a visible difference from 50. I'm setting the processor priority to high even though I've never noticed a significant difference in performance in doing this, not just with Dwarf Fortress but with any application. You be the judge. Now here's something really subjective. I'm turning off the mouse entirely for the game. I've never used the mouse with Dwarf Fortress. I don't even know how to. It might be better with a mouse, I couldn't tell you. I've got an old keyboard with onboard hardware for Macaring that's customized to play Dwarf Fortress, and I don't imagine I'll ever budge from using it. You should turn on the mouse picture if you are going to use the mouse though, because Toady worked hard on it. Now that's about all I'll be doing with the init files, but there's one more file here I want to edit before playing, and that's the announcements.txt. This one dictates the triggers for in-game announcements, as well as when your game should pause or when your view is recentered on some kind of event. I'm fine with the way it is for the most part, but there are a few triggers in here that drive me absolutely nuts, and I think most of you who have experienced these things will agree with the changes. For example, pausing and recentering for damp or warm stone digging cancellations. This is especially frustrating when you are fully aware of the impending cancellation, say when digging directly underneath a cistern or magma trenches used for your forges. By removing the PR, the game won't pause and recenter for this, but I will still get the announcements. I don't mind some of the pause and recenters associated with strange moods, but in my opinion there are too many. I don't really need to be ripped away from what I'm doing when the dwarf claims a workshop or starts a new construction. If you're relatively new, I might recommend against removing the recentering because you might not notice when a dwarf doesn't have access to the right kind of workshop or doesn't have all the materials he needs. I'm going to cut the amount of recenters in half for myself though. Now last I'm going to cover a big one, and that's job cancellation spam. If you don't know what job cancellation spam is, don't change this. Knowing when workers cancel jobs can be important and includes information on why the job was cancelled. There are certain situations that cause job cancellations to be relentless, however, and I don't like seeing angry red text all over my screen. I admittedly lose a bit of efficiency by removing these announcements, as I don't always notice right away when, say, a dwarf runs out of the type of stone he's using in crafting, but overall I definitely don't miss seeing job cancellation messages. That's all I'm going to be messing around with when it comes to the announcements. I hope this video has been helpful in some way to you. I'm going to start covering the Raws here in a bit, and that's a much more interesting topic. This is how I feel sometimes.